uh, not not a very good uh, circumstance surrounding what is going on uh, in our in our in our city, and yet we know that indeed that God always is in control. So our prayers, especially for those uh, who had uh, met those accidents yesterday, but uh, for us who are here today, uh, we're always privileged that indeed when we had uh, partook the Lord's Supper, that indeed, thank you Lord for saving my soul, but also a life that we have that we could serve Him today. Thank you, choir, for that. Uh, thank you for our young people. The uh, title of the song is uh, Took the Cross. Uh, going back to what Christ did and what he's doing for us as, uh, as uh, believers. Today, I'm going to bring to you in our meditation upon uh, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll be reading in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now these thoughts came to me and came to us, many who had been trying to help, especially with those with special needs. Special needs in relation to what we believe that the Bible alone could solve it. I'm talking about the anguish of the soul. I'm talking about the blame, the guilt. I'm talking about the restless nights when we are struggling with something that we know that the Bible is the one that is going to give us the cure. Come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, and ye shall find rest unto your soul. I know today many people would like to call it psychological problems would come from the word psyche, means soul. And yet we know that the Bible has many things that has to say about the soul, especially the care for the soul, especially how God is going to give us rest of our souls. We are transported back to what I'm going to share with you this morning, the centrality of the gospel. I will use it interchangeably with the cross. The centrality of the cross in the Bible and also in our lives. I was still a student at the time and I could remember that together with the uh, singing team of the seminary, we went to Cebu and we were trying to get a visa to go to the United States. Now there were some of us that were given visa but most of the singing team, they were rejected. Of course, they had been training hard. And then all of a sudden, everything just came to a stop. It's because they were not granted with a visa. So during the night, it was Sir Samar who was leading the team. We were having a devotion. And during our devotion, I was really expecting of some whatever theological thoughts that he will be bringing to us to encourage us. It was just a brief meditation and devotion that night. He just opened the Word of God, he read the Word of God, and he said with just few words, we thank God that today we were not given a visa. We thank God it's because of the salvation that we have received from God. The United States Consul rejected us, but Jesus did not reject us. I don't know if it took many, many years until today, or right away we would say, man, what's the connect? Where's the connection? Where's the connection of your daily life of being rejected with a visa and with your salvation? So this is why this morning I'm going to venture into the centrality of the gospel, both in the Bible and in our daily lives, because later on you would realize that this is so essential. And without this, many of us would still be fluctuating or probably very tired or pr probably very bored or probably there is not even a single joy left in us in following him. And I hope that this message this morning would bring us that we are going really to live both as the result 
and also as the dynamics of the salvation that we have received as we live for God. Now I'm going to start with what, what, is, what is first presented to us and then we would go to the Bible of the centrality of the gospel. In, in very few words, the gospel according to the Apostle Paul he mentioned here, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preach unto you. But also on verse 2, it says, By which ye are saved, if you keep in memory what I preach unto you. On verse 3, it says, I delivered unto you first of all, which I also received. Now this is now the gospel. How that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. And in verse 4, he was buried and rose again according the third day, according to the scriptures. He would summarize everything that what the Bible would tell us about the gospel in these few words, Christ died for our sins, he was buried and rose again. There are seven things right away. If you know your Bible, there are seven things right away that would come out with these few words. First of all, the holiness of God. Why would ever Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, would die? The second to that, because man is sinful and God is holy. Right away, the death of the Lord Jesus Christ has something to do, the demand of God's holiness. But also, the sacrificial death of the Lord Jesus Christ, that is the third that we could find here. Not only we see here the holiness of God, not only we see here the sinfulness of man, but also we could see both his incarnation and his substitutionary death. Why is he doing it? John 3.16, for God so loved the world. In other words, this death had been the result because God is showing his love and showing his mercy to us. But because Christ resurrected from the grave, it shows us the acceptance of the sacrifice. Throughout the Bible, starting in the Old Testament, looking into that perfect sacrifice, the perfect sacrifice is Jesus Christ. So when God received accepted the sacrifice, we could see the power of his resurrection. Will there be any resurrection from the dead? Will those who are facing death, will there be any hope? The resurrection, the power of his resurrection. But then, of course, lastly, the seventh one we also see in these few words. Salvation and forgiveness is offered to us all. So I don't know if any of us have ever thought that when we think of the gospel, right away, seven things is true to that. The holiness of God, the sinfulness of man, the incarnation, the substitutionary death of Christ, the love and mercy of God, the acceptance of that sacrifice, the power of his resurrection, forgiveness and salvation now God is offering. Now, I am telling you that because probably to you, you could just summarize the gospel to a very simple act of faith, and it has to do with acceptance. Why you are saved, I accepted Jesus. And very few, few words, personally, we could just say it that way. But I hope this morning we're going to expand, we're going to see how the gospel really, with these seven things that I mentioned to you, that this is real, this is central, both in the Bible and then in our lives. Now let me start with the Old Testament. The Bible would start with the creation. God is presented here as creator in the beginning God. God will never take more time to prove that there is God. Right away, it, it, it is just assumed that there is God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then a very fast-moving creation story. And then here comes the third chapter. Man fell unto sin. And then in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, the seed of the woman, right away, there is now a solution to what had happened with man. So throughout the history, we would find out that this is nothing. This is very selective. God is just going to give us very few information, but really focusing on what Christ will do, the seed of the woman. If you're going to look at Luke chapter 3, if you're going to look at Matthew chapter 1, we realize that the names there even started with Adam. All of them became important to us because they will be the one that would be in the genealogy of Jesus. 
In other words, when we look at the Old Testament, it is nothing but just His story, the preparation of God to bring us Jesus Christ. The cross, the gospel, is the center of the Old Testament. And you would say, Pastor, how about the laws? How about the Ten Commandments? How about everything that we have seen in, in Exodus, in Leviticus, in Numbers, in, in uh, Deuteronomy? Two things is very true. God is showing himself that he is holy and also man is sinful. Now, this is very needful in understanding our salvation. I had some, I had some interviews to some people in relation to this. I said, why, what were the circumstances? What was your desire? What was your, what was your situation when you decided to accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? I got, I got these answers. Someone said I was in trouble. I was burdened. And then I found out Jesus to be the answer to my problems. I think that's good. Now, I am not saying this because I am doubting your salvation, but I just want you to have the full view. Probably that was the entrance of God in your life because you would never consider God without those problems and, and then troubles. But you know what's the problem with that? You don't have troubles now, right? You don't have as much as burden that you had before. That's why today, God is not really that real to you. Because as far as you're concerned, God is only for my problems. But how about for my everyday life? Now somebody said, you know, I got so scared of hell. So when fear of the punishment of God because of your sin had been taken off. Wow, Christians sinning with no fear because yes I've already accepted the Lord Jesus Christ the fear is gone now I could do whatever I want really is that salvation somebody said I accepted Christ because everybody's a Christian I understood that this was the right thing to do really nobody explained to you that you were a sinner nobody explained to you that it took God everything that he had his son to pay for the penalty payment of our sin. He wanted to have relationship with you. It's not because you were born a Christian. It was not because it's the right thing to do. It is something to do with my and your situation in this life. I am condemned. That's why Jesus came. And somebody said, you know, I accepted Christ because nobody really was paying close attention to me. I found my importance and my worth in Jesus. That's why I accepted him as my personal Lord and Savior. So now you have all the importance, you have all the worth that you wanted in your life. Now do you think now, right now, God is still, your salvation is still the central of your life? I've taken care of those, of those hurdles in my life. So now, I'm free to do whatever I want. Now, going back to the seven, the holiness of God, the sinfulness of man, the incarnation and the, the vicarious atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love and mercy of God, the acceptance of the sacrifice, the power of his resurrection, the forgiveness and salvation that he is offering. Now, this is the gospel to us because Jesus died for our sins. He was buried and rose again. Now, we talk about the sacrifices in the Old Testament. There were pictures. Later on, some, some, uh, some uh, prophets would detest the sacrifices. He would be even telling the people, who do you think God is? With all of the blood and with all of the <laughs> polluting the air, do you think God is so, is so happy because of what you're doing? God is looking at your heart. The Old Testament were looking forward for what Christ will do at the cross. So the offering has nothing to do that you will find forgiveness, but rather your faith on what Christ will do in Calvary. 
This is for them, the message of the gospel. That's why later on the Pharisees, well, they know the Old Testament. They could argue. They could find every rules and regulations in the Old Testament. They memorized all the law. They think by knowing the Old Testament, this is it. Jesus had to rebuke them. Look at John 5, 39. Jesus is going to tell them this. This is much clearer in some translations, but let me read to you in our, in our King James translation, John 5, 39. It says here, Search the scriptures, for in them ye think you have eternal life. They are they which testify of me, and ye would not come to me that you might have life. You know what Jesus was telling to these well-versed, they master the Old Testament. You thought by studying the Bible, you're going to find life. Primarily, it's not about finding life. It's about finding me. And in finding me, you will find life. It's not the other way around. We are 90 years old, and I think some of us probably would look at it the other way around. To us, being a Christian is not even relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. To us, being a Christian is being a member of Dawn, being baptized while we're still young, being part, you know what kind of clothes you're going to wear, you know the right things you're going to say, you know all the right things you're going to do with your life, and yet you are considered Christian. You are from Dawn. Jesus is saying, it's about me, people. It's about me. Praise God for everything that you have heard about the Word of God. Praise God for all of that. I know you're going to have life, but before you're going to have life, you are going to have me first. So Jesus and what he would do on Calvary is the center of the, the Bible. So now when we go to the Gospels, we realize that there are so many things that we want to know that it's not in the Gospel. I mean, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they are called the Gospels. We don't even know what he did while he was still growing up. We don't even know what he was doing when he was a teenager. In his 20s, all of a sudden we would let, see him right away. He was already 30 plus years old. But then if you're going to see the bulk of the writings of the life of Jesus, more than half is concentrated on the last week of the life of Jesus. You know why? Everything will be focused on the cross. So when we look at when we look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the focus, we know right away, it's about his sacrificial death on the cross. And then we open the book of Acts. That's the propagation of the gospel. And then later on, we open the, apostles, the epistles. It talks about the explanation, the interpretation of the gospel. But then really, in the book of Revelation, we want to see what's there for us. If you have your Bibles with you, let me read to you some verses in the book of Revelation. Some of the time element here is beyond our time. This is probably 1,000 years from now, a million years from now. Look at Revelation 5:12. It says, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamp that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing and every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Blessed and honor and glory and power be to him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. Not only that we could look back and see the centrality now, when we talk about the Lamb, we talk about the sacrificial Lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ. John the Baptist would say that, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Fast forward to the book of Revelation in the last days, if there would be last days, there in heaven, He was not magnified as the Creator. He was not magnified as anything. The only work that would be remembered in heaven is the work of Jesus on the cross. Worthy is the lamb that was slain. Now I hope right now, 
I already brought to, to your attention that the cross, that the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, the gospel, Christ died for us, for our sins, he was buried and rose again, is central in the whole Bible. In Revelation 12, 11, it says, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. We find it very interesting how this would be repeated over and over again, even looking at the last part of the book of Revelation, talking about the Lamb, talking about the one who have given himself so that he could and he should pay the penalty of our sins. Look at the last chapter in chapter 22, verse 3. And there shall be no more curse, but, a th but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it and his servant shall serve him. Go, going back a little bit in chapter 19, verse 13, describing about the Lord Jesus Christ here, his eyes on verse 12 were a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had name written, and no man knew but he himself, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. Now why the Lamb? Why being slain? Why dipped in blood is over and over again mentioned here? In other words, it's not even talking about he's the creator of the universe. He's here. We're going to worship him. In other words, the single one work of Christ, work of God in this universe, in our universe, in humankind would go back to only one story. Christ died for our sins. He was buried and rose again. You know, I am telling you that this morning it's because probably many of us we're living a life with no joy. We're not even excited. We're just here because we're here. God is not our passion. Christian life is boring. We have so many preoccupations, focus, attention. We are not living right now as the result of the gospel. Gospel is not lived every day, today and always. To us, it was a past thing. And it's not even bothering us when we are just waiting for the day that God would bring us to glory. And we would say, that's the gospel. That is salvation to me. I want to look at the Apostle Paul, his life and his writings. He is one of those writers that would bring the centrality of the gospel. Now, he would be dealing with many things. He would be dealing with this question, with that question, with that doctrine, and with that doctrine. But those who have studied the writings of the Apostle Paul will find out that in anything that in everything he's doing for the church, there is really one central as far as he is concerned. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2. He was responding to the many questions and many problems. And yet in the middle of or the start of his writing and many more we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But look at in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verses 1 and 2. And I brethren... When I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. He was dealing with many things. And yet when he started, he would just right out say, it's about Christ and Him crucified. The crucifixion, the death of Christ, His payment for our sin was the center of His ministry. Now, probably right now you would be sitting there and said, Pastor, what's this? Is this like a doctrinal, doctrinal class that you're talking about? Okay, so that we could apply it in our lives. Let me skip some of the things that I have, that I have written here. What if the gospel is not, the cent is not central to us? Three things that is true if the gospel is central to us. Number one, legalism. Number two, condemnation. Number three, 
whatever I feel, that is the truth. Subjectivism. So if the gospel today, and that is very scary for us fundamental Baptists, because we are so focused on the truth. We are so focused on living the truth that if we are going to take out the gospel of what we are doing right now, there's such a big possibility that our churches, our families are raising up the new Pharisees of this generation. Now let me explain with, with, what, with what we call of this legalism. Now some of you would try to, would try to, uh, to uh, argue with me that legalism has something to do with the law. Legalism has something to do with you need works to, to be saved. Now somebody defined legalism as trying to achieve forgiveness, acceptance by God through my work. Now many people, many people would like to just look at salvation right away as the way that people are being legalistic by following rules and regulations. But think about it. What am I doing today? Some of you may be legalistic. Why? You think by coming here, you are gaining God's favor. By being here, probably you are praying on something that you want God to answer your prayer. So it's a God, I was going to church. God, I gave my tithe. God, why all this? But why God, these things are happening to me? Wow, what a legalistic mind we have. Let me tell you this. Nothing could ever change God's love to us. Whether we are good or bad Christian. Now later on, I'm going to tell you why we should not be bad Christian. But right now, I'm just going to tell you that. In other words, in the eyes of God, the good Christians are not in better standing as far as grace and blessing is concerned. In the eyes of God, we are all the same. God is loving. God is merciful. God had forgiven our sins. Now I am telling you that it's because later on we would be discussing about blame. We would be discussing about shame. We would be discussing about guilt. But then as we start with this legalism, nothing that I do today would ever change God's dealing to me. He will always love me. He will always forgive me. He will always be merciful to me. Even killing me, let me say this, even killing me so that I would not put his name to shame and for the good of his name and for my good that I am not going to ruin my life. You could find that in the Bible. Sin unto death. You know, sometimes we think, oh, now I am free to do whatever I want. I don't think so. God's love is beyond that. But then I'm not going to think right now that I'm, do, I'm going to do something. I'm going to sing in the choir. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. So that I could get the grace of God. That is legalism. Now, we have so many things here in the Bible that would show us. We don't have time, but uh, if you have your Bibles with you, and some of you are taking notes in Luke chapter 18, starting in verse 10 to verse 14. Here is the story of Jesus, a parable about the publican and the Pharisee. In verse 11, the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, and just adulterers, even as this publican. I fast twice in a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Every time we have this in our heart, the holier than thou, I am better. I am more spiritual. Wow, what a legalistic mind we have. And I want to tell you, if you are not living daily because of the gospel, 
And because of the effect of the gospel, right away, all of a sudden, the grace of God is turned into my works. I deserve to be blessed because I serve God. Now, nobody, I believe nobody is exempted from this. I heard of a missionary story. After many, many years in Africa, finally, he retired. And then he went home. On the very same ship that he was on in going back to America is also the same ship where the president of the United States went to Africa to do a dead hunting. So as soon as they arrived there in the port in America, because the president is coming who have killed lions and all of that, all the bands and all the soldiers and all of them, nobody could even get out first. The president with all the and here comes the missionary after everybody left. Nobody was even there to welcome him. You know, he started thinking, I'm serving the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I'm with only the President of the United States of America. And yet he's getting all the attention on me after I spent all my life What I got from all this. And then later on he was rebuked. This world is not my home. I am just passing through. The people have heard the gospel. Will someday forever and ever will sing praises to God. And thankfulness that he had been the blessing. That they have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, you could be a very, you know, long in serving God. And yet, because of this legalistic mind, I need to get something because I'm serving God. Now, what is the cure? Pastor, what's the cure? How could be, I be cured of that? Now, very simple. The gospel. The cross. Lord, what a privilege for me to serve you. Lord, if I am here, if I'm serving you, if I'm loving you, Lord, this is because you have given me the privilege. You have saved me. Now, there was a time in my life when I was looking at the life of the Apostle Paul. In some of his writings, it seems that this guy has a very low self-esteem. Now, somebody would tell you that if your child has a very low self-esteem. He would do some bad things. Now, is this low self-esteem? In First Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for he counted me faithful, putting me in the ministry, who was before a blasphemer, a persecutor, injurious, Look at verse 15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came to the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. I believe there is nothing here about being low of self-esteem. He just wanted to bring back himself to where he was before. God, there was nothing. I only received mercy. In other words, every single one of us, if we would come here, if we are going to serve God, knowing who we were before, then we realize that legalism them is coming out from the heart that is worshiping self. Legalism is nothing but just another masquerade of pride. I am better than other people. I do this for God. God, I'm doing all this. Why the center is you? What is the cure? The gospel. So I was thinking that this man here had a very low self-esteem. No, he was just bringing himself back so that he would always know. God, I'm here because only of your grace. But the second here we find about condemnation. The word of God in Romans chapter 8, there is no condemnation to them which are who are in Christ Jesus. That is Romans chapter 8 verse 1. You know why I'm saying that? It's because, you know, some of us would still want to consider something about karma. If something would happen to us, we'd say, oh, no, 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 this is karma. Memorize this verse. Live this verse. Nothing that had happened to you right now, it's because of karma. As a result of your sin, there is no condemnation. Now you would say, Pastor, what I'm 
I'm suffering right now because I have been hit because of the result of sin. Of course, that is the result of sin. The Bible talks about sowing and reaping. So what happened to you right now? But right now you're sitting there, you're hearing the word of God. I want to encourage you. You are here because you could have been gone long time ago. You are here because there is no condemnation who are in Christ Jesus. In other words, I'm not coming here and saying, mm, I don't know if I'm going to sing the choir again. I don't know, Pastor. Come on, come, come on. Just, just encourage others. Me? Pastor, you don't know me. I know you by the grace of God. I know you by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no condemnation for you. There is no condemnation for me. Could we now serve the Lord joyously? Could we serve the Lord now with no blame or guilt over our head? Because the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. That is the very reason that it took the Son of God to cleanse our sin. He is the only one that could ever do that. But you know what's the worst thing? We look at others. Now, we don't have time, but I want to tell you, there's passage in Matthew chapter 18, verse 23 to 35, lengthy, lengthy story of Jesus about a man that had been forgiven. But later on, he found a man who owed him much, much, much lower than what he owed his master. He took that man and then put him in jail and said, pay me. You know sometimes what's wrong with us? We find alibi, rationalization, why we are hard on other people's sin. I want to tell you, we have nothing to judge because the very finger that are pointing at others, the three fingers are pointing at us. We have no accusation against a brother or sister because there is no condemnation. If God is not bringing condemnation on that life, I said, Pastor, he's living in sin. I know he's living in sin, but look at him, he's still alive. In other words, he's living on God's mercy. Let's pray that he would get his heart right back with God before the mercy is over. There is no condemnation who are in Christ Jesus. The worst are we going to condemn others because of their clothes? Are we going to consider to condemn others because of this and that? Do we really know about the gospel? But lastly, not only condemnation, but also we could see that we are all subjected to how I feel. You know, I don't really feel good today. You know, the way I look at you, you know, I don't really feel good at you. And then everything we put our theology on feeling rather than knowing God died for me. He loved me and gave himself for me. Now as we close this morning, what would be my attitude because of this gospel? Number one, I could see gratefulness. Why are you singing the choir? I would not be here. I would probably with my friends, drinking throughout the night, but the Lord rescued me. If ever I have a song to sing, I want to sing that song to the God who have redeemed me. Thank you, Lord. I can sing in the choir. Joy and peace, because there is freedom. Nothing could ever get me again. Nothing, no, no condemnation. That's why I'm so joyous. I'm serving God. I'm, I'm free. Thank you, Lord. And the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. But thirdly, grace-filled life. Grace-filled life. In the same way that I accept grace, I also give grace and mercy to others. The verse for that is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10. The Apostle Paul says, I am what I am, but I work harder than any of them. But the more I work, it's not really about me. His grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. But I labored. And then he would say this, Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was in me. In other words, if you are the most busy person serving God, all you could say, this is God's grace. No pride. No, I'm better than others. It's all but the grace of God. But then lastly, 
It's all about worship. It's all about worship. We're praying for Sir Samar. But you know, his life had been spent to many of us, including myself, who have shown me that being rejected there in the U.S. Embassy, there is something to thank the Lord of because we are not rejected by the Lord Jesus Christ, who have shown that salvation has its effect in my everyday life. And today, if this is God's will, the salvation to bring us up to glory, it's because of the salvation that both he had received, he had preached, he had suffered long to train the next preachers. Salvation, the gospel, the cross of Christ is the center of both the Bible and in the life of the believers. Heavenly Father, bless your word upon our hearts. Oh, may Lord, that not legalism, not joy, not guilt, not blame, not anything that is already plaguing your children, but always, Lord, hanging to the cross, clinging on to the cross, knowing, Lord, that it was there that the Lord had saved us from our sins. He was buried. He resurrected to give us life. Bless your word upon our hearts. If there are those who have come who need salvation, and Lord, you have pointed it that it's your relationship with you, may indeed that the study of your word would make it so plain and would convince the heart as the Holy Spirit would work to be saved today. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.